I bet you've seen plenty of videos saying, do this to keep your readers engaged, or write this way, or world build like that. There's plenty of that content on YouTube, including my own. The thing is, all of these videos can give you a lot of insight, but they are one person's opinion. However, I ran a survey and gathered responses from a plethora of readers. I threw it out onto Facebook, chucked some advertising money behind it to eliminate the bias in my own viewership, and received over 500 responses. So this isn't just my opinion of what you should do in fantasy world building. This is my analysis of what fantasy readers really love in the fantasy genre and the five things you should definitely include in your world building. Welcome to another episode from Just In Time Worlds with your host, Marie Mullaney. Let's start with just a little bit of background about the survey itself. I asked a number of questions to gauge what readers loved and hated about fantasy worlds in general, the fantasy genre specifically, and magic systems in particular. What we're going to look at today is the world-building elements that readers love, what keeps them reading fantasy. There will be another a video where I will talk about what readers hated, what made them put the book down, and a video specifically about magic systems, because there is a lot to be said on that topic. But for the purpose of understanding my analysis process, I just want to give you a brief overview of how I approach the survey results. If you're not interested in how I approach this, there are chapter markers down below and feel free to skip on ahead. There are some questions that have just numerical results and I will show the percentage results for that on the screen when we get to them. But there's also a lot of free text fields and I analyze those free text fields by looking for any similarities and by doing some sentiment analysis on the words used and by looking for common nullities of words that people used in those fields. On a side note, I am reasonably qualified for statistical analysis. It is part of my day job and it is what I trained for at university. I do have a degree in mathematics with a focus on statistics. So I do have some idea of what I'm doing in this field. So that's just an overview of the survey and my approach to the analysis. But that is not what you're here for. So let's talk about what readers love about the fantasy genre. Before we plunge into the specifics, let's speak at a high level about the fantasy elements readers love. You know, dragons, magic, other realms, the whole shebang. My survey included questions on how much fantasy they like in their books, from barely any, maybe not even magic, to everything and the kitchen sink. The result was a resounding cheer for more is better. Readers love their fantasy rich and loaded. So if you're hesitating about whether to add another mythical creature or a mysterious artifact, Think no more. The audience is essentially all for the fantastical elements in their fantasy. I also asked about words, both how much fantasy words readers liked and what kind of prose they preferred in their fantasy. The feedback in both cases are pretty clear. Most enjoyed a moderate amount of fantasy words. They appreciate the creativity, but they don't necessarily want to carry a dictionary to enjoy your book. As for prose, most readers are okay with an occasional anachronism, as long as it doesn't pull them out of the story. So you can get away with words like okay, but don't describe a tree as being skyscraper tall in medieval fantasy. And that was the takeaway from the purely numbers part of this analysis. But where things got interesting 
was with a deeper dive into free text questions. What do readers love about the fantasy genre and which are their favorite books? Those two fields in combination with the numerical questions is what gave me the five things that fantasy world builders should do more of. So, let's get into it with thing number one. According to the responses in our survey, readers overwhelmingly love it when an author takes the time to build a world with depth and layers. But what does that really mean? From the analysis of their favorite books and what they love about the fantasy genre, readers want a world that feels lived in. They want the fantasy elements and the magic system to be well integrated with the world. This means considering how the elements of your world interact. How do the inhabitants live day to day? What do they eat? How are their governments structured? How does magic affect their daily lives? What about the fantastical ecosystems they live in? A really great example of this is always Brandon Sanderson. And indeed, if I think about the Stormlight Archive, he made the safe hands a thing there. So women carry cover their safe hands, right? And this in his world has made that safe hand be something titillating, something attractive, which of course is ridiculous. I mean, there's nothing inherently sexy about a woman's hand, but because it's covered, when it's not covered, that hand is something sexy. So think about your layers of world building in those terms. What would people find titillating in your world? What changes have you introduced in your culture that ensures that people have this different perspective on the world. Creating such a world requires research and imagination. It might mean looking into how real world cultures and ecosystems work to inspire your own creations. And also remember, while high fantasy worlds are often vast and epic, the same principles apply to smaller scales. Even if your story is set in a single city or town, the depth with which you develop that setting can make all the difference. It turns a mere location into a character of its own in your story, one that can captivate your readers just as much as your protagonist does. Of course, I have quite a few videos that can help you with that. Besides many videos on magic systems and on fantasy biomes, I also have some videos dealing specifically with how to integrate magic to your economy and your politics. So check out the playlist linked in the info cards for inspiration on this topic. And let's continue onward with thing number two, magic systems. Magic systems are every fantasy world builder's bread and butter, and readers love them. But what they love most, according to the survey, are magical systems that feel fresh, well-balanced, and are intricately woven into the fabric of the world itself. Readers don't like MacGuffins. They want the protagonists to work for their victories. And this means that magic systems shouldn't just solve problems. They should have strong limits and good, interesting costs. Readers want magic to feel real, to be part of the world. And if you can get that right, magic becomes a powerful tool for storytelling, not just a convenient plot device. As I said, I will be doing a full video on this topic, so look out for that. But in the meantime, check out my playlist on magic systems for inspiration on this topic. And like with a layered world building point above, integrate your magic as deeply into the world as you can. Let it shape the culture, inform the economy, even affect the evolution of societies. Let magic be more than a tool. Make it an integral part of your characters, including their expressions, their idioms, their resources, 
and their way of life. And characters are the third thing we want to talk about, so let's turn to them next. The real story is the characters we meet along the way. Sorry, I couldn't help it. However, it is also true. According to the survey, readers crave characters who are as diverse and complex as the worlds they inhabit. The, these are characters who have their own stories, motivations, and flaw. Characters who evolve and grow as the story unfolds. Think about it. A hero who starts off brave and strong but never faces any personal challenges might seem flat or unrelatable. But a hero who struggles and learns and grows, that's someone we can root for. Someone whose victories mean something to us because we've seen their journey. Readers definitely appreciate characters who grow during the course of the narrative. And they appreciate characters who are different from each other, who are diverse. Diversity isn't about ticking boxes. It's about reflecting the rich tapestry of the world around them. Characters from different backgrounds, cultures, and walks of life can provide a range of perspectives that enrich the narrative making it more engaging and multidimensional. This diversity should extend beyond the protagonists to include a wide range of supporting characters who bring their own unique viewpoints and experiences to the story. For instance, a character who is a merchant might view the world's politics through the lens of trade, while a character raised by wizards might see magic as a tool or a burden rather than a mystery. These differing viewpoints can add layers of conflict and cooperation to your narrative, driving the plot in unexpected directions. And if you have fantasy species or races, the different viewpoints of these characters can vastly expand your story, making it real to the reader. Dynamic characters who change over time can serve as the heart of your story, their personal growth can mirror the larger themes of the narrative, adding a resonant emotional depth. Whether they're learning to accept their own power, overcoming prejudices, or just trying to protect the people they love, their journeys can inspire and move your readers. One of the things to remember with character growth is the lower you start, the higher you can grow. One of the reasons I personally feel that the Captain Marvel movie, the one that did really well, was not as good as it could have been is because uh, Carol Danvers's growth didn't start as low as it should have. She started already questioning herself, already with these superpowers available to her, and not fully as a in-control soldier because she had these emotional outbursts with her trainer. If she'd started at a lower point in the story, if her starting point from her character's perspective had been that she was the perfect soldier, no questioning, obedient to her orders, and her growth arc had been that she sheds that perfection of soldierness and she becomes her own person once again shedding it like a skin and learning to trust herself rather than the system I think that it would have been a more compelling movie because her growth arc would have been wider so don't be afraid to start your character at a really really low point versus where they're going to grow to if they're going to become a mighty hero, start them low. If they're going to become a person in charge of themselves, start them fully down at the bottom. And those kinds of growth arcs where you don't have power involved, like Carol Danvers didn't need more power. She already had power. My character Louis in Sangwill Chronicles starts at the pinnacle of his powers. He doesn't need more power. The problem with those internal growth arcs is they can be hard to pull off. 
I won't know until book four if I've pulled off Louis' growth arc. So I don't hold any of this against the writers of Captain Marvel or anything like that. But it is something to bear in mind that when you're writing that kind of internal growth arc, you want to start low as possible so that you can reach the highest point with your ultimate um, conclusion to the growth arc. So when you craft your characters, spend some time on their backstories, their cultures, their ambitions, and their fears. Make them vibrant. Make them flawed. And most importantly, make them change and grow. The lower you start, the higher your arc. What are your favorite characters? Let me know in the comments below. And let's talk about how to convey the fourth thing that readers really want in fantasy stories. Emotional and thematic depth. A truly memorable fantasy story does more than transport us to other worlds. It makes us feel deeply for the characters and their journeys. It makes us think about the message the writer is giving us. Lord of the Rings tells us about the strength of the common man. Dune warns us about the risks of false messiahs and prophecies. These are the stories that stay with readers, according to the survey. Readers are looking for stories where the fantasy elements are not just exciting, but also emotionally resonant reflecting universal human experiences and themes. This is where the magic of your world meets the realities of the human heart. But how do we achieve this? It starts with the themes you choose to explore. Themes like power, identity, freedom and sacrifice are potent because they are universally understood and felt. By weaving these themes into the fabric of your fantasy world, you can elevate your narrative from a simple adventure to a profound exploration of life's great questions. For example, a story could explore the theme of power through a character who gains magical abilities that sets them apart from others. How does this power affect their relationships? Does it corrupt? Or does it compel them to act for the greater good? Similarly, themes of sacrifice can be deeply moving when a character must give up something precious for a cause they believe in, mirroring sacrifices we all make in our lives. These themes resonate because they mirror the challenges and decisions your readers face in their own lives. When a character struggles with questions of identity or freedom, readers see parts of their own struggles reflected in these stories. This creates a powerful emotional connection that makes the events of the story more impactful and meaningful. It's also about the emotional journeys your characters undergo. Their fears, their loves, their triumphs and their failures should feel real and relatable. When a character suffers a loss, the grief should be palpable. When they fall in love, the joy should leap off the page. This emotional authenticity is the key to making your fantastical elements relatable and your world immersive. One of the greatest examples, in my opinion, of this is Jacqueline Carey's Kashiel trilogy. I truly felt down to my bones Fedra's struggles with everything. But it wasn't just her emotions. It was also the way the world was built. They say, love as thou wilt, all the way through the books. But all the way, Fedra realizes that there is a hard truth at the center of love. That love is more than just a gushy emotion. It is the core of what makes us human. It is the thing we crave and it is the thing that will drive us to the greatest heights and the lowest depths. And that drive, that feeling of love in those world-building moments, in everything 
that resonates with this theme in the Kashil books spoke to me personally. And that is why those books are still my favorite fantasy books. So reach deep for your themes and build them into your world in a way that resonates, hopefully, with your readers. By focusing on emotional and thematic engagement, you provide your readers with more than just an escape. You offer them a mirror to their own world, seen through the lens of the fantastical, which can be both enlightening and incredibly moving. And of course, one way to convey that message is through the judicious use of tropes. So if you've enjoyed this discussion so far, hit the thumbs up button. And let's, and for our final point, let's talk about tropes and what readers love. One of the areas I explored in the survey was how readers react to different fantasy tropes. Tropes are those recurring themes or elements that can sometimes feel overused, but can also be a comforting and familiar touch in a new world. The four tropes I asked reader opinion on was prophecy, the chosen one, the dark lord, and the femme fatale. In each case, the available responses were, I always love this, positive. If done really well, I like this, somewhat positive. I'm neutral towards this. Unless it's amazing, I dislike this, somewhat negative. And I always hate this, negative. The results surprised me. For all that we speak about overused tropes, most people fall either into somewhat positive, neutral, or maybe somewhat negative territory. Very few fall into flat-out negative. This tells me that really it comes down to the execution of tropes. A fresh twist on an old trope can breathe new life into a story and keep your readers hooked. So don't be afraid to use the tropes. Just don't follow the same old paths. And when we do the mistakes video, I'll speak more about that so subscribe and ring the bell to make sure you're notified when that video goes public. Or you could become a member of the channel and get access to it right now. But how do you breathe fresh air into a fantasy trope? Let's take them one at a time. First, prophecy. Instead of the traditional prophecy that heroically foretells the Savior's coming, what if your prophecy is misinterpreted or mistranslated? Or there are two sides reading the same prophecy with different results? This is what I did with my prophecy in Sangwil Chronicles. There are multiple translations, many interpretations, and two sides to the prophecy who both believe they're right and both think they're trying to save the world. And if that sounds interesting to you, check out the books on the links below. These kinds of shifts can create a narrative where characters are actively trying to understand and perhaps outsmart their destiny, adding layers of suspense and moral dilemmas to this old trope. Second, the chosen one. This trope often centers on a predestined hero chosen by some ancient law or power. But what if being the chosen one is not a blessing, but a curse? What if the chosen one is actually destined to end the world, not save it? Or perhaps the chosen one is a title that passes to a new individual once the current bearer dies. How does that affect the individual's psyche and life decisions, knowing they are bound to a fate that isn't glamorous, but grim? Three, the Dark Lord. Typically, this character is purely evil with no redeeming qualities. But let's twist that. What if the Dark Lord started with noble intentions akin to a tragic hero from Greek drama whose fatal flaw led them down a dark path? This complexity makes an antagonist more relatable and their eventual downfall more poignant. Or... What if they're a flawed character who is doing the right thing, but using terrible methods? What if they genuinely believe they're saving the world? Just be careful here. 
In my opinion, Thanos from the Marvel Cinematic Universe failed at being this because his motivation in saving the world doesn't hold up. Killing half of all life will not make the universe a better place. It's just dumb. So make sure that it's a smart motivation if you go that route. And four, the femme fatale. Often seen as a manipulative woman who uses her charms to ensnare the hero, or gender bender, a manipulative man using his charms, you could reframe the trope to show the person who is misunderstood and branded as manipulative by society. Their story could explore themes of empowerment and the struggle against societal expectations, turning the trope into a commentary on misjudgments and strength. Each of these twists not only makes these old tropes fresh, but also deepens your narrative, making your fantasy world more unpredictable and engaging. When you play with these elements creatively, you not only keep your readers on their toes, but you also invite them to explore these traditional roles in new lights. And those are the five deepest world-building insights I mined from the survey. Layered world-building with more fantasy, not less. Magic that is embedded in your world. Diverse and dynamic characters that feed emotional engagement with a plot. And don't fear using tropes, just make sure you execute them well. Next time, we'll dive into what elements world builders should avoid, so stay tuned for that. Or become a member of the channel and for the price of a cup of coffee, get early access to videos along with these cool perks. But don't feel pressured to support the channel financially. You can also support the channel just by watching another video. Since you enjoyed this one, maybe check out my video on making ubiquitous magic systems feel real. Or you could trust the algorithm with its recommendation right over here. And I will see you soon for another episode from Just In Time Worlds, where we build what we need, when we need it.